Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. I'm all my day. Police in the United States, through a series of Supreme Court decisions, as well as policies enacted by state and city governments, have become largely immune from prosecution even when they commit serious felonies such as murder. Police officers are criminally charged in less than 2 percent of fatal shootings and convicted in fewer than one-third of those cases. When officers injure but do not kill, they are even less likely to be prosecuted. Police in America are virtually omnipotent, prosecuted in a handful of high-profile cases that receive national attention but otherwise freed to engage in lawless behavior, especially in poorer communities. University of California law professor Joanna Schwartz in her book Shielded, How the Police Became Untouchable, details the myriad of ways the legal system has stripped the citizens of protections from police abuse. The wholesale blocking of civil rights litigation means that police are rarely held accountable for the crimes they commit, blunting all efforts to enact meaningful police oversight, legal accountability, and reform. Joining me to discuss her book, Our Failed Justice System in Police Forces that Function, Especially in Poor Communities as Rogue Militias, is Professor Joanna Schwartz. Let's begin, as you do in the book, with the legal antecedents, especially Section 1983 became law in 1871. What was Section 1983? Why was it made law? And how did it protect the citizenry? And why and how has it been rolled back? Section 1983 was first passed by Congress in 1871, following the Civil War during Reconstruction, when newly uh, freed slaves, former slaves, Black Americans were being tortured and killed by the newly created uh, Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacist groups. And local law enforcement and government was doing nothing to intervene if they were not themselves participating in the violence. And Congress, looking at this evidence, decided that there needed to be a federal law allowing people to sue for violations of their civil constitutional rights in order to um, give those rights uh, actual meaning. And so they enacted uh, what is now known as Section 1983 for its place in the U.S. Code, but was at the time referred to as the Ku Klux Klan Act. Um, Very soon after Section 1983 became law, uh, decisions by the Supreme Court and by Congress Uh, made Section 1983 and other Reconstruction Era acts uh, lose much of their power. And it was really not until 1961 when the Supreme Court first recognized that Section 1983 could be used to sue government officials, police officers in the the case, uh, which is called Monroe versus Pape, uh, for the violations of their constitutional rights. So after 90 years in obscurity and and disuse, Section 1983 was recognized by the Supreme Court as being this tool that could be used to sue for constitutional violations in 1961. But then after a sort of momentary heyday with uh, the power and potential of 1983, um, the statute has lost uh, progressively its power and it's lost its power through Supreme Court decisions primarily that have cut away at the ability to sue um, in a variety of different ways that I outline in the book that begin at the very uh, initial stage of trying to find a lawyer through pleading a complaint with the court, through proving a constitutional violation, qualified immunity, holding local governments responsible, uh, and beyond. So this 1961 uh, decision uh, opened, as you write in the book, uh, or, or a kind of flood of lawsuits. I remember talking with the civil rights attorney 
Lynn Stewart, and she said this was a kind of golden era in the judiciary where citizens really had the capacity to hold uh, government agencies, including police, accountable. Um, and uh, th that it was essentially that surge in suits that produced the backlash, and including in that backlash, as you write in the book, uh, or accompanying that backlash, was a kind of mythology. Can you explain how that worked? Absolutely. And, and I should say that the evidence <laughs> definitely shows that the number of claims uh, that were filed under Section 1983 increased dramatically after 1961, as well you would expect, because it was the first time the Supreme Court said you could sue under this statute. Um, but the claims that uh, were alleged, uh, the, the story that was told about the effect of these claims is, is really does take mythological proportions. Uh, the, the, the story goes that uh, courthouses were flow, overflowing or threatened to be overflowing with frivolous lawsuits uh, that these lawsuits were bankrupting or would bankrupt uh, officers who were simply doing their job in good faith, uh, and that all of these lawsuits would discourage people from taking on the job of a police officer or from, from aggressively uh, enforcing their duties as a police officer. And without a robust police force that we as a society would descend into chaos. And, and truly, you can see versions of that story or pieces of that story uh, told by courts, by journalists, um, and by politicians in the years after uh, Monroe versus Pate was decided. One of the effects was that state, uh, states passed laws, uh, cities passed laws, where uh, they obliged local governments to pay damage awards and lawsuits against police officers. Uh, can you explain that process and what effect it had on police misconduct uh, and what happened when line items in the budgets for damages exceeded the amount set aside for damages? So in the uh, 70s and 80s particularly, oops, I should say 60s, 70s, and, and early 80s, uh, states and localities across the country enacted what are called indemnification statutes. Um, and indemnification is, is an idea that we see in private industry all of the time. If there is a truck driver uh, from a company, the truck hits you, you would want to sue not the driver uh, themselves, but the, but the company that hired them. The idea being that the driver probably isn't going to have the resources to pay uh, that settlement or judgment, and it's really the work of the of the truck owner or the truck company uh, that should be held responsible. This is the same idea that states and local governments uh, had when they created these indemnification statutes, which provide that uh, when an officer is sued, they will be given a lawyer free of charge, and that settlements and judgments against them will be paid uh, by the local government or by their insurer instead of by the officer themselves. And these indemnification provisions vary. <clears throat> There's usually some exceptions to the kinds of things that the city agrees to cover. Uh, and the coverage is limited to conduct taken in the course and scope of employment. Uh, although when I have researched settlements and judgments in police misconduct suits across the country, what I found was that virtually all of the money comes from uh, the local governments and from insurers. I found in 81 jurisdictions, a six-year period, 99.98% of those dollars came from the local governments and their insurers. And notably, it does not come from the police department's funds. Uh, I did a follow-up study where I looked to see what financial impact these settlements and judgments had on the police departments. And what I found was Often, um, the money may come technically from the police department's budget, but that mo money was already budgeted to the police department from the central budgeting process. And when departments went over budget, when they spent more money than expected on 
lawsuits. The extra money came not from the police department. They weren't required to cut back on overtime or equipment or anything like that. Instead, the money was taken from other parts of the central budget. And what I found when I looked into uh, how this practice worked in Chicago was that the excess money ends up coming from portions of the budget that were earmarked to go toward those least uh, politically powerful people within the community. There was a city attorney for the city of Chicago who said when payouts went up in lawsuits, uh, lead paint testing went down. And so the very communities that are disproportionately the subjects of police surveillance uh, searches and violence are also the ones who have their uh, their budgets and the, the parts of the budgets earmarked toward them stripped away to satisfy settlements and judgments in cases alleging police misconduct against people within their very communities. And in cases like Chicago, where you had Burge and that torture center, that sort of clandestine torture center, we're talking about millions of dollars. Absolutely. I mean, in the last 10 years, I think Chicago paid half a billion dollars in in uh, settlements and judgments. And they pay an extra many millions of dollars uh, toward private attorneys that they use to defend uh, their lawyers or excuse me, their officers in some of these cases. And, and as I describe in the book, there are there are many instances uh, of cases where Chicago, uh, the Chicago police officers had extreme egregious allegations against them. Uh, many millions of dollars were spent defending these cases um, only to lose a trial and have to, to spend many millions of dollars more. And they are the, the police department uh, is is playing with house money in these in these situations. They suffer no consequences uh, of spending uh, extreme amounts of money to fight these cases instead of what would be better for the community um, as a whole, um, which would be uh, to to resolve these cases uh, to satisfy uh, the demands of, of people who have righteous claims, and then to work to prevent these things from happening again in the future. Can you talk about the role of prosecutors in internal affairs divisions and both uh, these these two institutions you write in the book really serve as a, a way to protect police from legal accountability? Yeah, in the introduction, I, I talk about the fact that if you are trying to seek justice following a, a rights violation, there are really three paths. And I focus in the book on civil lawsuits, lawsuits seeking money damages or other kinds of forward-looking relief. And in part, I focus on that because the other two paths, which are criminal prosecution and internal affairs investigations and discipline, uh, are so dysfunctional. Um, as you mentioned uh, previously, uh, officers are very rarely criminally prosecuted, rare when they kill people, but but far rarer when they use force or other kinds of misconduct that don't result in, in death. Uh, and internal affairs investigations are also extremely difficult to have uh, brought and successful. When the Department of Justice has looked at police department internal affairs investigations across the country, it's found that police investigators don't use the basic crime fighting tools that they would use if they were trying to solve uh, criminal cases. They don't um, interrogate uh, officers who offer virtually verbatim statements to their fellow officers about what's happened. They don't interview all of the witnesses to the event. Um, and for these and other reasons, officers are rarely uh, disciplined or terminated. Um, in addition, law uh, enforcement unions uh, have worked with with passion to create law enforcement officers' bills of rights that create uh, a great deal of protection for those officers in the disciplinary process and uh, the ability to appeal and arbitrate decisions uh, that are uh, against those officers. So even in the rare instances in which officers are disciplined or terminated, uh, those decisions are often overruled or overturned um, through that arbitration process. Can you explain qualified immunity and how it works? Qualified immunity, which has been in the news a great deal, although it's a term that 
remains elusive to many, uh, perhaps because uh, it is it is so uh, nonsensical. Uh, is is a defense that was created by the Supreme Court in 1967, uh, so six years after Monroe versus Pape was decided, and at the time it was described as a good faith defense for officers who had violated the Constitution, but who had acted in good faith, thought that they were following the law. Uh, That standard for qualified immunity shifted dramatically in 1982 when the Supreme Court said, forget about officers' subjective intent. That will take too long to resolve. The question is whether officers violated clearly established law. And the Supreme Court's descriptions and definitions of clearly established law have gotten more and more constrained over the years, fueled by these myths about the dangers of making it too easy to sue, so that today officers are protected by qualified immunity from damages awards in civil cases, uh, unless there is a prior court decision holding unconstitutional nearly identical facts. It's not enough to find a prior case. Um, that offers a general principle like uh, that an officer can't use force against a suspect who is surrendered. Uh, You have to find a prior case in which an officer uses a similar type of force uh, against a person who has surrendered and demonstrated that they've surrendered in a factually similar way. Public attorneys are provided for people convicted of a serious crime who can't afford one but they're not provided for those whose constitutional rights have been violated by a police officer. How has this barrier benefited police? Well, it's very difficult to bring a civil rights lawsuit without a lawyer. People do it uh, and uh, do it regularly. But when you think about trying to uh, overcome a defense like qualified immunity, be very hard to do that without the assistance of a lawyer. And the Supreme Court has made it more difficult for people whose rights have been violated to find lawyers. Uh, The Supreme Court has done this through a series of decisions that limit the ability of lawyers to get paid in these cases. Uh, Congress in 1976 created a statute which is called Section 1988, which gives prevailing plaintiffs the ability to get their reasonable attorney's fees. And Congress wanted to enact this statute to make sure that there were enough financial incentives for lawyers to bring cases alleging constitutional violations, even in cases that didn't have enormous uh, damages awards from which a plaintiff's attorney could, could take their cut. But the Supreme Court has interpreted Section 1988 to allow that when settling a case, um, a defendant can offer and a plaintiff can agree to waive that entitlement to attorney's fees. Uh, And most cases that are successful settle, which ends up meaning that the sort of contingency fee relationship where lawyers are only uh, expecting to get a portion of their client's recovery is how lawyers are assessing the risks and benefits of taking these kinds of cases. And so cases involving people who have been killed by police, high-profile cases that are expected to garner a significant amount in terms of a a settlement, are cases that are going to be, uh, they're people who are going to be able to find representation. But cases involving constitutional violations then don't result in death um, or uh, other high damages kinds of harms, even if they are serious constitutional violations. And people who are not going to be sympathetic to a judge or jury uh, for any number of reasons um, are going to have a really difficult time finding lawyers. And the problem is not only that uh, those clients will not be able to find lawyers, but my research and interviews with lawyers suggest that the challenges of bringing these cases and the ways in which the Supreme Court has interpreted the ability of lawyers to get paid in these cases has led to lawyers deciding not to bring any civil rights cases at all and focus instead on criminal defense cases uh, or personal injury cases, medical malpractice cases, where they have an easier time making a living. Well, you write that the lawyers are reluctant to take cases, and these are your words, unless the victims are, quote, likable, credible, and articulate. And, and that criteria 
often cancels out the marginalized. Uh, can you talk about that? Absolutely. So, so this is, uh, those quotes are from lawyers who are thinking about uh, what clients they want to represent. And they're thinking, looking forward to how a judge who has tremendous discretion over these cases, or ultimately a jury if the case gets to trial, uh, is going to think about this client and and what they deserve. And, and as a practical reality, um, that may, for it does for some lawyers, cut out uh, anyone who has ever been involved in the criminal justice system before. Um, this is not true for every jury across the country, but particularly in more conservative parts of the country, uh, juries are... Or lawyers are concerned that uh, jurors are not going to be sympathetic to a person who's previously spent time uh, in jail or prison. Uh, this may cut out people who have mental health challenges, people who are LGBTQ, uh, because of just the the biases of jurors, black jurors, indigenous jurors, Latino jurors. Uh, excuse me, black plaintiffs, indigenous plaintiffs, uh, Latino plaintiffs. Um, homeless plaintiffs, these are all categories of people who are disproportionately the subject of police violence, um, but may also be uh, considered less articulate, sympathetic, et cetera, to a jury, and so may have an especially difficult time finding a lawyer. Terry versus Ohio, Supreme Court decision 1968. The court rejects the notion that stops and frisks are wholly outside the protections of the Fourth Amendment which was ratified to ensure that Congress would not send government officials inside people's homes without a warrant or probable cause. Then Chief Justice Earl Warren uh, rejected the notion that police needed probable cause. Uh, This case was a significant blow, as you write in the book, to the Fourth Amendment and the protection against intrusive police behavior. Uh, Justice William O. Douglas, who was the lone dissent in Terry, wrote, There have been powerful hydraulic pressures throughout our history that bear heavily on the court to water down constitutional guarantees and give the police the upper hand. That hydraulic pressure has probably never been greater than it is today. Yet, if the individual is no longer to be sovereign, if the police can pick him up whenever they do not like the cut of his job, if they can seize and search him in their discretion, we enter a new regime. Talk about that ruling and what it's meant. Terry versus Ohio was a case that assessed whether the the power of police to stop and frisk. And that was something that even back at that time uh, was happening all of the time. It's certainly in the news today, but it was it was happening all of the time uh, on the streets of of, uh, our country. And there was an open debate about what police's authority was to stop and frisk. Uh, it was the view of law enforcement officers that stopping and frisking was not covered, was not protected at all by the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures uh, to the interpretation of the law enforcement. Uh, this this did not fall into either of those categories. And to their opponents, to civil rights advocates uh, like the NAACP, L- uh, Legal Defense Fund, uh, stops at risks should be treated as wholly within the Fourth Amendment, such that you, an officer, would need probable cause uh, before doing a stop or frisk. So Justice Warren split the baby in some ways. He said that this uh, kind of stop and frisk was covered by the Fourth Amendment, but it did not require the full protections of the Fourth Amendment. It did not require probable cause uh, instead, it was it was only a reasonable suspicion that officers needed to have before they stopped and frisked people. And part of this justification, as uh, Justice Douglas suggests <clears throat> in his dissent, was related to the fact that uh, the late '60s involved it was a time of of great upheaval. Uh, you know, protests. Um, assassinations uh, and the like. And so the argument was that police needed this kind of discretion and power in order to keep us all safe. But the way in which Terry versus Ohio and the reasonable suspicion standard has come to be interpreted and understood 
officers have virtually unlimited power to stop and frisk uh, anyone uh, under almost any circumstances. Um, the police can have, have no reason or an unlawful reason can stop someone because of their race. Uh, but so long as they can come up with a um, basis that is not unconstitutional after the fact, uh, that is that is enough for this Supreme Court. And we've seen across the country millions and millions of people stopped and frisked, disproportionately people of color. And that power is really the product of the Supreme Court's decision uh, in Terry and the subsequent interpretations, increasingly uh, expansive interpretations of what reasonable suspicion allows. You point out in the book that the killings of Michael Brown, Walter Scott, Eric Gardner all began as ordinary police interactions where police were within their constitutional authority to approach, stop, and engage, but it culminated with police murder. Yeah, this is a this is a point that uh, has also been powerfully made by my uh, UCLA colleague, Devin Carbato, who points out that the initial, by making the power to stop and frisk uh, as broad as it is, it ends up leading to interactions that can then ultimately culminate in the use of fatal force. Uh, because if the officer exercises their extreme power to stop and frisk, and then the person runs away, there is then the power and authority to pursue. Um, or if a person uh, in the, you know, appears to the view of the officer to have a weapon, uh, this then authorizes the police under the Fourth Amendment uh, to use fatal force against that person, whether or not they actually did have a weapon in their custody. So the initial, uh, by making it as easy as it is for officers to stop and frisk and have that initial action interaction. Uh, they also pave the way toward uh, more um, violent and fatal uses of police power over those people. I teach in the New Jersey prison system through Rutgers and the college degree program, and most of my students are people of color, but very large black men say that because they're large, uh, and, of course, George uh, Floyd, Eric Garner were very big men. That in and of itself, just their size in the eyes of the police constitutes a threat. And they have to carry themselves far more carefully on the street because they're far more susceptible to uh, draconian forms of force simply because of their size. Yeah, that is not a surprise to me, unfortunately. And the way in which the Supreme Court has interpreted the phrase unreasonable searches and seizures is not from the perspective of the person being searched and seized and whether it was unreasonable to suspect, you know, unreasonable for them to be subjected uh, to that conduct when they had done nothing wrong, but instead on whether it is reasonable in the eye of the officer in the moment without the benefits of 2020 hindsight um, under all of the circumstances that they uh, are that are that appear to them, whether force was appropriate under those circumstances, and it is uh, it, it is an, an, a beyond unfortunate reality that that assessment of threat um, will, in some circumstances, relate to the plaintiffs, the person, the victims. Uh, race and size. The Supreme Court has legalized all court forms of uh, warrantless searches. I wanted to explain if you could explain how these warrantless searches are legally justified and what effect they've had on the public. Well, initially, uh, you know, the, the warrant requirement um, has been viewed as a, a sort of a, a hallmark, a key of of the Fourth Amendment and of constitutional protections um, and the need for a warrant before going into a person's home more than anything, which has you know, been described by conservative justices as sort of the pinnacle of constitutional protections. That warrant requirement has been eaten away um, in part by 
uh, this reasonable suspicion standard that was first articulated in Terry um, that we were just speaking about related to stop and frisks. Reasonable suspicion has come to um, play an important role in um, weakening the the standards as well for um, not uh, not knocking um, and announcing presence before entering um, the home with a warrant, and and also the the allowance of many many exceptions to the warrant requirements, so that now this notion that you have to have a warrant um, is is uh, been swallowed by exceptions to that to that rule, all of which uh, or most of which are justified again by the same uh, notion that you need to uh, give officers maximum leeway in order to protect uh, from from crime or 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 to keep people safe. Um, the whole warrant requirement, the goal of having a warrant, the intent behind it was to have a neutral. Uh, a neutral third party, a judge or magistrate who could sit in and deliberate about whether to allow this most extreme uh, deprivation of privacy uh, and liberty. Um, but that notion, and those benefits have been outweighed time and time again by this claim of the need for quick action um, and shutting out the, the ability to have that neutral third party come in to to assess the circumstances. Great. That was Professor Joanna Schwartz on her new book, Shielded, How the Police Became Untouchable. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, Dwayne Gladden, David Hebden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrisedges.substack.com. <laughs>